Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan, as always, joined by Matt as we enter the 13th season of Fireside Chat. And Matt, this is going to be a unique year for us and for the Flames. How are you doing? Oh, uh, good. Uh, looking forward to talking Flames hockey once again. You and I last saw each other in person at the draft when we did our live show, and then we talked with our friend Kevin about the uh, Johnny Goudreau passing, and here we are today to recap the entire offseason and get everyone ready and positioned for what's coming up, which is preseason hockey. We're there already. Yep. It's Talking exciting. About dra- Talking about the draft, um, you and I went through the first round with everyone that was at Bow River Brewing. Thanks for those that joined us back in June. What are your overall thoughts? We won't go through pick by pick, but overall thoughts. How the Flames do in this draft? I think they did fairly well uh, overall. That they needed to get skill and size at all positions, and I think that they had a fairly good um, balance of getting like a high end defenseman with their first pick with Zane Parekh, um, and some high end skill with Andrew Basha and uh, Matt Vagradin. And some interesting picks as the draft went along. Like, Battaglia was an interesting pick, and it'll be interesting to see how these guys develop. I'm not sure what to expect out of Gridden after everything that's come out this summer. Their 28th pick, Matt Vay Gridden, and he's he, he lost his college eligibility, and they're trying to find a place for him to play. And I think this might be a pick that we look back at and go, you know what, maybe a guy like Basha, maybe a guy like, um, you know, I think even a guy like uh, Miss Luke Misa, they might end up surpassing him in terms of NHL readiness, but it's nice to have options. Well, and Gradine, he actually did look really good in um, the Penticton tournament. I thought he was one of the better players that the Flames had in those games. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, you know, everything is a little bit up in the air uh, with him and his whole saga for, and like he just got traded his rights. Um, so. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see exactly which place he goes after uh, training camp. Back in June, you could feel the, I guess, the excitement come out of the room when we were sitting in the Bow River Brewing Tap House, and Aginla got drafted by Utah, but I think since then, everyone's really comfortable with the Zane Parekh um, pick. Like, everyone I talked to in Calgary seems to really like it. You and I like it. I think the Flames hit a home run there. And as you and I talked about before the draft, and we won't talk about this too much, but they couldn't have made another pick if Aginla was on the board. And I think in some ways it was good he was gone to give him some more flexibility. I agree. And I, I think that like if he had fallen to the Flames, that the Flames would have selected Aginla. And uh, even some of the comments from the management kind of were talking about that their thoughts of taking a forward at that pick, which, you know, reading very transparently through the lines uh, that's who they were thinking of uh but you know getting Parekh uh, it's always like when the Flames and any team are in a situation like this where they're needing to tear down to the studs to rebuild their team I've always viewed it as more important to draft defensemen first especially with your high-end draft picks because those guys tend to take a little bit longer uh, in terms of uh, developmental time to get to be like the top pairing defenseman in the NHL and uh, where you know if you have like a flashy player like a McDavid uh, like kind of plug those guys in and they're ready to go right off the hop and uh, you know the Flames I think have done a very good job both with the trade deadline and the draft of getting a bunch of higher end uh, quality defensemen into their system so that way like in two or three years that all of those guys should be starting to push for the NHL uh, when this team is starting to turn the corner a bit well, let's talk about guys pushing for the NHL The uh, we didn't talk in July like we usually do but the Flames made a whole bunch of UFA signings and uh, interesting to see we'll talk about the UFA signings we'll talk about some guys that have left some re-signings, and then we'll look overall at how this um, affects the team in the lineup. How does that sound? Definitely. So the first one that came out, with the I would say the biggest surprise of the day for me, the Calgary Flames signed Anthony Mantha. Uh, he's a 30-year-old right winger, shoots left. He's played for Detroit, Washington, um, and Vegas last year. 
and they signed him to a one-year deal, three point five million. This is the biggest deal, I guess, money-wise of the day, but also the biggest name of the day. Were you surprised to see a guy like Mantha coming to Calgary? Uh, not really. Uh, the Flames are in a position where a player like Mantha is going to get a lot of opportunities to get good numbers uh, on the power play. Uh, he's always had an excellent shot, and it being a one-year deal. You know, like, honestly, this is a player that I expect to play until about February with the Flames and then get traded at the trade deadline. This screams trade deadline move. Yeah. And I wouldn't even be surprised if there's sort of a gentleman's agreement between Conroy and the agent that will move you. Yeah, and it features well for him for next year as well. Like, if he has a really dynamite season with the Flames, then, you know, you're looking at getting more than $3.5 million next year as a ufa once you're up again so you know the way i looked at the signing it's like oh the flames just got a second round pick plus you know for next year's draft and you know like it'll help the flames in the short term but also getting some long-term assets you know and i've said this for a long time is you need veterans to do a rebuild correctly like you can't just have a bunch of 18 19 20 year olds you need nhl players guys who've been around the league for a while to, to make sure that those young players understand what they're doing and how this works and how to be pros and even just to help the young players because they know the league and I think this is a great example of that I think you'll probably see Mantha and Huberto together maybe this brings out better in Huberto whoever they're paired with on center I think that this is a win-win all the way around would I go out and buy an Anthony Mantha jersey no I think it's a one year not even one year and he's out but you know, it can't hurt to have another veteran around this team. No, and especially because the Flames, uh, like most of their high-end prospects and talent are guys that they've just recently drafted. Uh, like, those guys aren't going to be pushing into the NHL this year or next year. And Buys you a couple of years. And so you kind of do need to have placeholders that can just do the job for a bit while you're sorting out those kind of things. And also a guy like that who I think you can say to young players, beat him, right? Take his spot or take, you know, a spot higher in the lineup. And, and it gives you some markers for the young players to say, hey, you want to be in the lineup? Got to be better than Mantha. Exactly. And it, to me, it's a win-win all the way around. Like the Flames are not never going to completely tear down. Like even though they've tear, teared down quite a bit, like they're not going to end up being like Buffalo or – uh, you know, some of the other teams that have gotten lost in the wilderness, like what sort of like what uh, San Jose has done where they have nothing and, you know, like it's going to take them forever. Uh, Calgary is kind of looking at, you know, rebuilding, but not, um, you know, completely tearing it down. The retooling. Yes. And, you know, I mean, this is a guy who last year, had over 40 points he played with washington got 34 points played with vegas got 10 so you know even if you can get 30 points out of this guy i mean washington was not a great team either so if he's on a not so good team getting 30 points even if you can get 20 out of him here for 3.5 for a year you're still getting your money's worth out of anthony mantha oh for sure and the flames also need to hit the cap floor so uh, you know uh, as strange as that sounds um as of now, they got twenty million dollars available to spend. Yes, it's like, hey, come, you know, you need to dump a contract. Here you are. <laughs> Just a reminder: Matt and I both play for league minimum. Um, he'll be Mantha will be wearing number thirty-nine for the Flames. The next guy we'll talk about a goaltender they brought in. They did lose. Um, well, as we know, they they got rid of Markstrom. They also uh, lost their AHL backup. So they, they were looking for somebody new, I guess, to fill that role. And also probably the AHL starter role, if you think about it, because Wolf is going to be moving up to the NHL. So they brought in Devin Cooley, who's going to be wearing number one, it's expected. That's his training camp number. He's a goaltender from Los Gatos, California. Uh, played six games with the San Jose Sharks last year and 14 games with the Rochester Americans last year. I think a very solid option, 27 years old. Um, I think you know what you've gotten, Cooley. I don't think there's a lot of upward development there, but I think a very solid American League option. Oh, for sure. And uh, frankly, uh, the Flames, uh, because of um, 
Dan Vladar recovering from surgery, like he is not necessarily guaranteed to be ready to go either uh, once the season starts. So it'll be interesting to see, um, you know, like once that happens, exactly where he will be um, in terms of because he's still a NHL goaltender, Cooley. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see exactly how things shake out. Oscar Dansk, who was with the Flames and the Wranglers last year, now with Anaheim. So um, he's probably taking that position. I think the Flames are going to make sure that Cooley gets some NHL games. I think that that's, you know, in a, a retooling team, I think you can definitely make sure of that. Like you said, with Vladar maybe questionable, I could see Cooley starting the year as a backup potentially, but I think the Flames are going to make sure that he's playing in the NHL for... I would say probably as many games, if not more, than he got in San Jose last year. Yeah, and the Flames, uh, with having uh, Valtteri Ignatiev uh, being uh, coming over to play in the AHL, having a veteran like Cooley to learn from also helps him as well. Yeah, for sure. And and again, I think Cooley moving up will give Ignatiev more ice time, which they're going to want as well. I could even see Ignatiev starting um, the year in the ECHL to get some time, but we'll see how all the goalies shake out. Yeah, and speaking of, I thought he played excellently uh, during the Penticton tournament. I thought he was the best goalie out of all of the teams. You know, it's interesting, and we won't talk a lot about him right now, but uh, I think we heard this from David Riddick when he first came over, too. He said, it's easier being a goalie play- from Europe playing on North American ice because you're used to these guys having a lot more room to come in on you. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking at Cooley's stats from last year in the NHL. This shows how bad the Sharks were. Six games played, 25 goals against. Well, yeah. I think that, you know, even if you put uh, prime Patrick Waugh on that Sharks team, his goals against average would be over four. Like, yeah. You know, like, it, there was no helping that team. <laughs> there was not, no. So, uh, we'll see what happens with Devin Cooley. But if nothing else, Wranglers fans, you're going to get to see uh, a solid goaltender in net there. The next one is an interesting uh, pick. This is a, a born and raised Calgary boy, Jake Bean. He's a left shot defenseman from Calgary. Played for the Hitmen, actually, um, for one, two, three, four seasons. He was drafted in the first round, 13th overall in 2026 by the Hurricanes, and is now a free agent. The Flames have brought him in. His dad was the, what was he, the president here, John Bean? So you probably didn't want to bring him in when dad was running the show, but now that dad's retired brought him in i like this pick and i think that there's still something there i mean jake bean i thought was a good junior even i've seen him play at the ahl level i mean his first year in the ahl was charlotte um 44 points in 70 games i think it was tough to break out in carolina with with how much depth they have on the blue line i think he probably never got the shot that he should have going to columbus for three years well i mean there's only so much you can do in columbus so i'm excited to see what they can get out of jake bean yeah, to me, uh, uh, when uh, the Flames signed him, I figured that Oliver Shillington was not coming back, and I figured well, that and, Jake and Bean is... Craig be- Connor is even saying that that day. Yeah, and I figure that uh, Jake Bean is be- more or less going to replace what Shillington was in terms of his on-ice play, that kind of rover-ish yeah. defenseman, and uh, we'll see how it works out. Just uh, before we move away from Cooley, before I forget, that's a two-year deal for Cooley, 775k average, and Jake Bean is a two-year, 3.5 million total, so 1.75 million dollar deal for Bean. Um, I think the nice thing about Bean is, I mean, he probably wants to be here, and you, Jake Bean, I think, still has some room to move upwards. Defenseman often peak later; he's only 26. We'll talk a little bit about this guy later, but I think you need to put Bean out there with a uh, with a veteran, and I really like the idea of him and Tyson Berry, potentially. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you look at the Flames, I mean, at the end of the year last year, they kind of just had a bunch of leftovers on defense besides Uyghur and Anderson. I mean, you know, Marimanov, Pakal, now they've got Ball, but I think that this really brings in a solid NHL option there. Um and, you know, sadly, he's probably going to push somebody to the American League or to number seven. But yeah, that's and the, that's likely going to be a Hanley uh, for... Yeah. 
ease of, uh, you know, because he's kind of been the number six, seven defenseman generally anyway. Exactly. Uh, the next guy, this one was a bit of a head scratcher to me. The Calgary Flames went out, signed 30 year old right winger Martin Furk, who hasn't played in the NHL for a couple of years. He played for Bern in the Swiss League and Rapperswil, uh Lakers of the Swiss League last year. 30-year-old guy coming in. This was... I, I don't know what to make of this this move. Well, Ferk has one heck of a slap shot and wrist shot. Like, he, uh, you know, he would probably be in the top five in the NHL in terms of quality of those shots. It's just that he is extremely slow and his overall game's kind of mediocre. So, um, I think that he's going to be a veteran uh, for the Wranglers. And I think with... Sutter retiring in the offseason, I think this is the probably the guy we stick the C on in the Wranglers. Mm. Something like that, yes. He's on a one-year, two-way league minimum. I don't think you sign a guy like that to a two-way if you're not anticipating him going to the American League. Um, but, you know, he played in the AHL in 2022-23, had 64 points in 67 games. So, obviously, you know, that's, what, two years removed? Probably still able to do this at the AHL level. I don't see Ferk wearing a Flames jersey come the regular season. I think this is purely probably a Wranglers move. I agree. And, you know, you need quality veterans, especially if you want to have the Wranglers be a competitive team. So, you know, it makes sense for them. Yeah. We'll see what happens. I mean, with the young young players coming in, you're not going to be bringing up a 30-year-old guy on a one-year unless you're really desperate or you lose a whole bunch of bodies. But... You know, I imagine Ferk probably wants to come back to North America, and this is a way to do it. So, uh, interesting to see him. He's wearing number 93 right now at training camp. Um, oh, and I forgot, Bean is 24. So, for those jersey number nerds, um, those are the numbers that we're seeing for these guys. The next one is a return to Calgary from a former fl- fan favorite, Ryan Lomberg, wearing number 70, coming back to Calgary after winning the Stanley Cup in Florida. Two years, $4 million, so $2 million average. Um, I More than I want to pay for this position, but the Flames have got all the money in the world. I like this signing. Yes, it, it, the Flames need energy and guys with a motor. And, you know, frankly, like you need players like this to teach other young guys coming up of this is kind of what drive you need to have if you want to be in the NHL. And Lomberg is all energy all the time. He's probably going to be the 12th or 13th forward. But, you know, the Flames need to have that kind of energy going, uh, especially with I the think Lomberg line. will be in your everyday starting lineup. Probably. I think it'll be Lomberg, Rooney on line four with whoever they – decide to put on that wing. I can't see Lomberg coming here and sitting out as 13. But, you know, nice to see guys, like, you know, when teams go through rebuilds, there's always that question of do free agents want to come as attractive. And I see a guy who just won a Stanley Cup, I would imagine had a whole bunch of options of where he wanted to go. Not a Calgary guy. I mean, he's from Richmond Hill, Ontario, but coming back to Calgary is awesome. He played here in 2017, 2018 for seven games, 2018, 19 for four games. So really not like he's played a ton with the Calgary flames, lots with the, with the Stockton heat. Um, I know you've always been a fan of Lomberg. So I, yep. when I saw the deal come in, I thought oh, Matt's probably smiling right now. Yes, I was. So yeah, g- good deal. And you know, if, if a guy wants to be here and even if you've listened to some of the preseason media with Lomberg, he loves Calgary. Like it sounds like his family's really happy to be back. Those are the guys you need, right? You want those guys who want to be here, especially when you're going through the phase the Flames are going through. Well, yeah, and especially after like the last couple of years where basically everybody's been wanting out uh, for you know hockey reasons mostly. Um, you know, you need to reestablish uh, that this is a place that people actually want to play, and so getting guys that actually want to be here. Um, helps, especially with the young guys coming up because they don't really have a choice right off the hop. Um, establishing that community here, basically, um, will help as this team transitions from the rebuild phase to, you know, back into trying, vying for the playoffs and all that kind of stuff. 
And, you know, there's not a lot of guys like Lomberg anymore. I mean, we don't really have the tough guys, the enforcer guys anymore. So I think that, you know, it's not like we're going to have a guy probably internally for that. That's where you might ask a guy like Martin Furk, an older guy, to play that role. But I think especially as you're bringing in guys and and smaller guys too, like Peltier and stuff like that, you need that kind of player, right? And I think that Lomberg, the energy is going to be great. I think the fact he's willing to, to mix it up, I think he's going to be the guy we'll see on many nights who's going to get this team going. I agree. An early fight, an early big hit, something like that. I think Lomberg knows his position. I think the Flames probably had to overpay a little bit to bring him in, but I'm okay with $2 million for two years right now. It's not like we're going to be against the cap this year next year. Um, and, you know, I think this is a perfect. this is the perfect look at we needed this type of player. We went out and got the exact guy that fits that role. Exactly. And A.J. Greer played that role last year. Just as a note, he's now off to Florida. Um, pretty much trading Lomberg for Greer in a way. Two years, 775 k for Greer. Yeah. Off to Florida. And he didn't play here all year. He got hurt. But I think Lomberg fills that role even better than Greer does. I agree. And in the latest signing, this one was another kind of head scratcher to me. Um, Jared Tenorti, 32-year-old defenseman from... Um, been I guess been all over the league, but from Chicago last year, he's a left shot. He played um, not he played 52 games with the Blackhawks last year. He's played for pretty much everybody: the Blackhawks, the Rangers, the Bruins, the Predators, the Coyotes, the Canadian. He's another journeyman defenseman. I think this is again a guy that you're bringing in to start the year in the American League. This is your veteran journeyman if it's not Ferk, it's Tenorti that's going to be your captain down there like you're bringing this guy in I think purely is an AHL move yeah and it's one of those where if the Flames run into a handful of injuries and they don't necessarily want to bring up one of the young guys you know having Tenorti come in for a few games to be the six seven guy that's fine but uh there's no illusions that like he's going to start the year in Calgary or anything like that it there are just too many players that are ahead of him. Well, and even when I look at veterans, like, I, you know, you're going to have Pakal here. You're going to have uh, Hanley here. Like, the Flames have, I think, established veterans who are going to start here first. This sort of reminds me of the Dennis Gilbert of the past, right? Sort of that older guy who's down there. I mean, Gilbert played some good games of Flame when they needed him to bail him out, but I think Tenorti is starting the year with a W on his chest, and like you said, will be there unless there's unless there's a platoon issue. Because even if there's a platoon issue, I mean, you might bring him up to be seven on a road trip or eight on a road trip if you're going away and just want a body. But if you're putting a guy in a game, I think they're going to want to bring up a young a young guy like Soloviev or somebody like that. Well, and it also it provides a little bit in, of insurance because, uh, you know, as much as uh, some guys like uh, Pahal and uh, Miramanov are, you know, got ice time at the end of last year, they're still an unknown quantity and they're young enough where they might fall off themselves and so having an in case of random you know regression from you know some of the maybes that this team has um you know having a guy that can actually play if necessary also helps and no, no offense to Jared Tenorti. Nobody's claiming on waivers if you're going up and down. No. Like, you know, everyone's got a Tenorti. If you looked at the Wranglers in the playoffs last year, they were really short on defensive depth. And even before the playoffs, like the Flames were taking so many defensemen, they really needed some bodies. And there's just another way of having another body there. Yep. <clears throat> and another defensive body, not yet signed, but here on a PTO, the only, I guess, notable PTO. Um, for this year, for the Flames, Tyson Berry, 33-year-old right-shot defenseman, played last year in Nashville at 15 points. He's played for Nashville, Edmonton, Toronto, Colorado. Um, I, I would say a, a sir, I didn't even when Barry got a PTO. I thought really he's not signed. Like I'd say a serviceable NHL guy. This is this is a guy I would like to see the Flames bring in. Yeah, uh, it wouldn't be a bad signing if the Flames do keep him. Um, it'll be interesting. The only the only one's bad for is Tenorti because it pushed you even further down that yeah. lineup. Uh, I could see uh, Barry. He had a really bad year uh, with Nashville, uh, but has been a serviceable player since he was in Colorado. 
Um, I, I view him as kind of the uh, budget um, Noah Hannafin power play two replacement guy. Um, yeah. And yeah, it, it, if he does sign, I think it'll be kind of along the same lines as Mantha, where it'll be a one year deal and flip him at the deadline kind of thing. But, um, you know, if he's even flippable, I mean, a lot of times depth defensemen don't go for much unless he's packaged somewhere. Even if he played the whole year here, I'd be fine with that. But you can't give him more than a one year right now based on last year. No. So Tenorti were in 26 and Barry were in eight at training camp, just in case anyone's looking for them this week when they watch. Um, and, you know, I mean, when I look at the Flames, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but when I look at that defensive group the Flames have, you know, I mean, Hanley, I would say. Um, you know, Pakal, Barry, like, I think you, the more of these guys, if we don't have enough young defensemen to fill that, let's bring in guys. And right now, I think guys that are proven NHLers, I would rather play or at least give a chance to a guy like Barry over Pakal or Hanley. I agree. And it, it's one of those where the Flames are just kind of in that, that right wrong position right at the moment where you know like the next phase of guys like uh, Grushnikov and uh, Brustevich and all that like they need some more AHL seasoning before they'll be ready and it might not even be a full season's worth like uh, those guys might be recalled after the trade deadline it's just one of those things where for right now uh, having serviceable NHL players I think is a better idea than you know kind of shoehorning some guys who might not be ready yeah. that might stall or ruin their development. I agree. I think mean, Call's 25. I didn't realize he was that young, so he's probably your 6'7". But Hanley's 33. If I'm going to ice a 33-year-old defenseman, I would pick Barry over Hanley. I agree. And at this point, I mean, you generally don't see PTO guys getting, you know, the the Brinks truck backed up. You're probably going to be able to get Barry at a, you know, a league minimum or close to if you wanted to bring him in. I agree. And it'll be... Interesting to see exactly how it breaks down. So those are all the additions. Should we talk about the subtractions next or anything else about the additions you want to talk about? One other player that uh, is on a PTO, uh, Luke McNamara. Uh, he's one of the prospects at the development camp and at Penticton. I think that uh, with how he played, uh, if the Flames have the ability to sign him, I think they should. Uh, he's a six foot three uh, forward. Um, he just similar to the the praise that we were giving to Lomberg. Uh, he showed a lot of energy every shift in the Penticton tournament that he was out there, and he was noticeable because of um, how physical and how much energy he brought. And I think that you know, like especially with him being six foot three, that wouldn't be a bad addition to the roster. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's probably not going to get NHL minutes, but might be a guy that you're putting on the AHL team. Yeah. This sounds a lot like the Sam Morton signing from last year, right? A guy nobody really knew came in and really impressed fans. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where, you know, um, you never know when guys are going to turn out. And, you know, if they're standing out to that degree, it's always worth giving them the shot. And even if the guy is nothing more than AHL depth for a couple of years that also helps Luke McNamara is currently 19 so not I don't think eligible to play in the American League this year yep. uh, you gotta be 20 to play in the American League still I think uh, playing for the Saginaw Spirit but yeah maybe a guy that they keep their eye on and bring back next year and sign him at that point so talking we talked about AJ Greer leaving Dennis Gilbert who was here um, for a portion of the year went to Buffalo one year 825k Ben Jones who is a staple with the Wranglers two years I was surprised to see a two year on that 775k Riley Damiani who the Flames brought in at the trade deadline uh, in kind of an AHL who do they move for Damiani? Uh, Pedersen Pedersen he went to Europe like that kind of surprised me that you'd trade for a player it was a forward for a forward deal and then the guy didn't even come back. Like you, you wonder why he wouldn't have just kept Pedersen at that point. I think it was just position. Uh, they needed a center instead of a winger. And then I think the biggest uh, name leaving was Oliver Shillington, and this didn't happen until you know, I think almost was it August that he moved. Yeah. 
uh, going to Colorado and not coming back here. And I mean, you know, I think a lot of people thought that he'd probably come back here. We talked a lot about this last year. We won't rehash all the issues. Um, it's reported he won a long-term deal and the Flames wouldn't give it to him, but he signed a one-year show-me deal in Colorado for $1 million. Great deal for Colorado if you can get him for a million. Yeah. Like you, like you said earlier, I think the Jake Bean move solidified that. And even if you listen to Conroy talk at his media availabilities, he talked about how the door was closing. Um, but, you know, I, I hope the best for Shillington. I kind of wish he came back. But interesting to see that it took him that long to sign somewhere. Yeah, and in the the long run, um, I wouldn't be surprised if like Bean and Shillington are basically the same player in terms of production. I like I don't think either guy is going to move the needle that much. Um, he breaks out in Colorado. That's awesome for him. Uh, the Flames also are, you know, to be blunt, are looking younger um, and like with getting guys like uh, Grushnikov, um, uh, Brustevich, Moran, um, Perek, like they've got a y- lot of guys that basically play a similar-ish role to what Shillington does. So it- it's not that big a deal that he's gone. It- no, and, and even with Bean, you know what he's got. Like, let's remember here. Let's rewind the tape a little bit. You and I questioned after the 2020-2021 season, does this guy ever wear Flames jersey again? Like, he looked terrible. And, you know, this was a guy who we were all surprised. He was looking so terrible back in the day. Like, he, he came in the league. He played his first uh, real season, 38 games in 18-19, got 10 points. He was a defensive liability at times. Sure, he had one good season in 21-22 where he got 31 points. I think that's the – I don't think that's the norm. It'll be interesting to see. Like it, the player that he'll be, I think you'll see this year in Colorado. And like if he doesn't have a good season, he'll be in Europe next year. Um, and if he does, then good for him. You know, I could also see him being like the Jared Tenorti, where you know he's good enough that everybody keeps him around. I mean, Tenorti's been around the league for so long as a 32 year old that he's good enough. He can be our seven. Yep. We'll see. Um, you know, I hope that he uh, you know has success in Colorado and you know still wish him all the best you know what everything that he went through you know like it's not easy and you know still wish him all the best on the personal side as well it's just and and if the rumors are true that he want a long-term deal I think that agent really needs to give their head a scratch or a shake because after you know the last couple seasons that he really hasn't played a full season i don't i don't think it's reasonable to ask anyone to give you a long term no like a yeah like a one year show, show me contract is exactly all he deserved like you know when you're basically gone for two years after signing a two-year deal it's like yeah. those um, are the rumors i heard floating around is yeah. that he couldn't get a deal done with the flames because they want a long term and the flames didn't and if I were him, I'd be questioning if I still want to work with that agent. Like, you, you've barely played for the last two years. I'm not going to give you four. I show me you can do it, and then we'll talk. So yeah, like come back. Like I, you know, like say he has a repeat of 21, 22 um, this year. Like after the one year, then sure, I'll give you a four or five year deal at five million per. You know, because that's commiserate with that kind of value, but you know you have to show me that you know a you're going to be here and b that you can do it and you know if you're not getting any sort of guarantee just give me the money it's like well you haven't really earned that over the last two years so interesting to interesting to kind of see that and see where things are going with that and um, I'll be watching closely he'll be wearing number 58 for Colorado just like he did here if anyone's looking for him um, kind of a weird number, but I was surprised didn't change it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's. I, I wish the best for Shillington, but we'll see what happens there. And I, I think we know what Oliver Shillington probably is as a player at this point. And mm-hmm. I think if you can replace him with Jake Bean, I mean, Jake Bean's actually more expensive by 750k. I think you're paying a little bit of a, a hometown premium for Bean, and and also I think there's more development out of Bean that could still happen, but. 
yeah, I mean, either way, I'm I'm fine with that. And if Shillington, you know, we said this a lot last year. If Shillington doesn't want to be here, I don't want him here, right? We said this when Johnny left. We said this when Matthew left. We said this when guys last year got traded. If they don't want to be here, move on. Yeah, exactly. And it it's always disappointing because, like, as fans, you know, you get to know the people it, from interviews and all that. So, you know, you grow attached to your own players, but you know at the end of the day you know if they don't want to be here and i and i think because we grow attached to them too we might be overvaluing what shillington is i'd be really curious to talk someone outside the market and see what they see him as well and frankly like an eric gustafson type guy where it's all offense no defense you know that's basically what i view him as um where you know he might be a little bit more well-rounded eventually but you know he hasn't really shown that either so yeah and i think that's that's the the whole thing is we don't really have a read on him because he really hasn't played the last couple of years so you know we'll, we'll see what he develops into he might be a late bloomer just because he doesn't have as many miles on his body but it'll be interesting to see yep. uh, let's talk about some re-signings the biggest one i think that was announced well definitely the biggest one but biggest one both in money and i would say in excitement igor sharon govich five years 28.75 million which turns into a 5.75 aav deal um we weren't sure with this guy i mean he came in from new jersey looked good last year does he want to stick around does he not and i think when you're seeing young pieces of your team committing long term like this that's exciting i'm i'm happy with that i love that number 5.75 even if the flames start to get competitive that's going to be a great number yeah it, it was one of those where you know it was kind of like if he doesn't resign like the, this is another guy much like this past year where you know you look to trade him at the trade deadline um similar situation like with kuzmenko um because they're both in that same age group where it's like okay if these guys aren't staying put then you have to look at moving them but um, I'm glad that uh, he's going to be here and, you know, he, he can play all three positions well. Um, and, you know, they, he has a dynamite slap shot and wrist shot. So 26. Yeah. So, I mean, we're buying the best, probably the best years of his career. Yeah. And realistically, uh, you know, if he's eventually turns into like the second, third line scorer guy for this team, like once we draft better guys uh you know in the coming seasons um towards the end of his contract that's still a very useful and respectable number for him um so all the way around like there's no problem with that contract at all yeah i i I feel like this was him betting on calgary and you know I think Calgary probably got a little bit of a discount because of it, but I love to see that. I mean, a 26-year-old guy committing the best year of his career to a team we know is rebuilding. And we've seen comments. I mean, we won't talk about them today, but we've seen comments from Coleman, from Kadri. They want to be here. They want to be part of this. And that's awesome to see, especially from a 26-year-old guy who easily could have said, you know what, guys, I'm done. I'm out. I don't want to be part of this. You love to see that. Mm -hmm. You know, not a guy at the end of their career who, you know, I'm just going to take the money and show up and play, and I'm not going to get better. I would say the Flames got a discount on this one. And, you know, you, you you can't go wrong with this player unless he gets seriously hurt at 5.75. No, and even if he's just a second, third line depth scorer, like that's still a good number for that kind well, of player. Well, I mean, that's kind of what we're paying the captain now, and he's arguably our, our third line center. So even if, you know, when Backlund retires or leaves or whatever happens there, he takes that position, you're pretty much, you know, filling the same money into the same spot. Mm-hmm. Um, the next one surprised me pleasantly with the number. Dustin Wolf got signed. This is one I was kind of waiting on. It's like, okay, we know he's going to be here. How much is it going to cost? What's going to get done? And two years, 850k each year. I'm kind of surprised he did two years of that money because this guy is destined to the NHL. I would probably have. I, I was kind of thinking he'd do one year cheap and then want to get paid. Again, a guy who I think is committing his uh, his future here. Flames better enjoy having a cheap starter because he's going to get paid after those two years. Yeah, like if he develops into the player that we expect him to be, like that that number is going to be a six or a seven. Yeah, I mean Vladar's making two million to probably be Wolf's backup this year. Yeah. 
And you're looking at, like, UC Soros basically as the comparable, and, like, the Flames might push Wolf towards uh, UFA status with, like, another one-year deal after this, but uh, then I would expect, like, a full eight-year, you know, here here's the blank check, basically, uh, kind of contract like Soros got, assuming that his developmental trajectory follows a similar path which i believe it will based on everything i've seen well i think that's probably why you got two years out of this and knock on wood i mean let's hope he develops the flames have not had the best luck with developing young goaltenders lately well we yeah, a- lately meaning the entire history of the franchise <laughs> except for mike vernon <laughs> yeah i mean okay so i mean they brought i would say that the flames did a lot of the development on kipper um they brought him in as a young guy um yeah okay but i mean even lately they brought in a lot of guys you know mason mcdonald drafted high bust right tyler parsons drafted high bust like you know they haven't even got guys that came close so you know if dustin wolf can buck that trend it's going to take some time and we still don't know what he is at the NHL level we're excited but there's been a lot of HL goalies that have looked fantastic in the American League and fizzled out at the NHL level yep and that's why like I you know like every year on our draft show basically like we should take a goaltender because you just never know Mm -hmm. until you get the Kiprasov or Jonathan Quick or you know insert name of star goalie here so I think the Flames probably wanted this to give them a two-year runway, right? To really see what this guy is. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll come back to the, ne- to the next guy here. I think it takes a little bit more discussion. But Ilya Soliev, uh, Soloviev sorry, got a two-year, 750K. Um, it's a two-way in the first year, a one-way in the second year. i not surprised that got done. I mean, that's a young player. I think the Flames want to stick in their lineup. I think the two-way for the first year shows that we got too many vets you're probably not starting here but that you know one way in the second year i think you can expect him next season to be in the top six for the flames yeah and he profiles as a good defensive defenseman your typical five six guy and uh between i believe uh, i believe i'm just checking here that the two-way one-way also follows waiver eligibility i think it's eligible this year not next year yeah and you look at like grushnikov and uh kuznetsov and himself like they're all cut from the same cloth and are all basically fighting to be the defensive uh partner on like either the three four pairing or the four or the five six pairing and uh, you know, like basically shooting to uh, uh, replace Tanev, more or less, and uh, being that rock defensive guy on the third pairing, and uh, you know, uh, all three of those guys need a little bit more time in the A to get there. But you know, I would not be surprised if uh, injuries are a thing that uh, Sloviev gets called up during the season. I wouldn't be surprised if he played more than fifteen games with us. Uh, it just we'll see. Yeah, I mean, especially if we've got older defensemen, like we're talking about thirty-three-year-old Tyson Berry, you know, thirty, you know, some of these older defensemen who might be out there. You're gonna have defense injuries. You know, you're going to. And I think Soloviev becomes the first call-up. Um, how long he's up here, I don't know, but I think he's definitely the first call-up on D. Yep, and he'll probably play fifteen to twenty games, maybe more, depending on amount of injuries but uh yeah you know he played rather well with the wranglers and in his brief stints up here um last year and i think he still needs a little bit of season oh for sure and i think that uh similar to where wolf was last year where he was kind of basically done at the ahl level it hit his time in the a i think is coming to a close and he needs to show what he can do at the nhl level but i think you're gonna see him basically be the first call up and then be the, like the full-time six next year i agree and i think having a veteran for him in the hl let's say that's tenority let's say that's hanley i that's going to really help him as well you know if you compare him and and barry or him and hanley or him and tenority that's really or, you know i don't think it'll be him and pacall but maybe um i think that really is going to help his development to have that veteran guy to play with i agree um cole schwint one year one year, two way, eight hundred and fifty k. Schwint got some time. He actually made his NHL debut last year. I don't think this guy is gonna start with the Flames. I think again, probably a depth call up, but there's something there. 
Yeah, uh, he'll probably top out as like a third or fourth line center, but uh, you know, there's enough there where he'll probably be a full time NHLer. Perhaps not this year, but next year. Um, like I'm kind of viewing him as Rooney's replacement after this season, and we'll see. Yeah, and that's where I think if there's a call up, you'd see him as well as sort of in that Rooney like spot, that fourth line center spot. Um, but again, I think a guy that needs a little bit more time in the American League. He's he showed well, I thought last year, but not quite there. Yeah, and th- there are always players like that that are close but not quite. And the Flames right now, having the roster they do, it, you know, there are easy to pass benchmarks like passing Kevin Rooney. Because um, like the Flames, like if say Schwint comes into camp and outperforms Rooney by a wide margin you know like there's no reason to keep Rooney at, you know and you can throw him in the A if you need to so it, you know we'll see yeah um, and then the last one here the one that I was kind of surprised it was taking as long as it did Jacob Peltier one year two way 800k and Peltier, as we know, was hurt for a lot of last season. When he came back to the NHL, he looked a little timid. He didn't quite look where he needed to go. He went down to the American League. Still didn't quite look right. I don't know if Jacob Peltier is going to turn out the way we all expect him to after his injuries. I guess we'll see. But not surprised to see a two-way on this. I personally think Peltier probably starts in the American League this year. I I Um, think that if he does not make the Flames out of camp, that he is no longer a Flame after training camp. I think because really? uh, he is waiver eligible and there are probably 30 teams that would take a flyer on a former first round pick I think that he you know unless he plays disastrously bad I think he will start in the NHL I didn't realize he was waiver eligible in that case then yeah you don't want him as your 13th forward yeah I think he'll start in the NHL um, for that reason alone and his leash might be short and but you know, I think that like the ten game addition kind of would follow suit with him unless he plays so terribly where it's like we don't care if he gets claimed on waivers kind of thing. Well, let's talk about that then. Let's uh, let's move over to that. So the Flames have more NHL ready bodies than they have spots, and we won't talk about outside flyer guys. But let's go through position by position and try to figure out who we think is in or out from kind of the the safe choices. So on the forward spot, right now the Flames have Sharon Govich, Kadri Kuzmenko, Zari Backlund Coleman, Huberto Postal Mantha, Lomberg Rooney, and Dewar as of are kind of the last year lines with the new guys slotted in. That means you've got nowhere for Coronado and Peltier. I think the easy thing to do if you want to put Peltier in is take Dewar out. We weren't happy with him last year anyways. Put Peltier in there. Do you start Coronado? Do you find a spot for Coronado in the NHL? No. I I think Coronado played relatively poorly in the NHL. Um, he looked better at the end of the year, but still a guy needs yeah, some season. Yeah, and I think him start... He is waiver eligible. He can go down with no problem. Yeah. I think you start him there and say, earn your way back. And I I don't think he'll stay down there the whole season, but... No, and I think he's your first call-up for kind of any position. You find a way to move other guys around, yeah. and he becomes the first guy you call Yeah, because when you have guys like Sharon Govich and Zari who can play all three positions, you know, it, unless those specific players are the guys that are hurt, you can maneuver whatever you need out yeah. of the lineup. So, you know... It, yeah, yeah. I, I think if you want to put Pelty in, which I could see them doing, and like you said, if he's waiver eligible, that changes things. But I think the easy thing is you take Dewar out. If you lose Dewar on waivers, oh well. Like I think Walker Dewar is a. I'm surprised he's lasted as long as he has at the NHL level. And I think they were trying to get him to sort of be that tough guy. I think Ryan Lomberg comes in and fills that role. Yeah, and frankly, I, if you have Pelty on the line with Rooney and Lomberg, I think that that will help. Um, Pelte uh, learn at the NHL level yeah. um, especially the energy level that he needs to bring in shift in shift out because like his personality certainly fits that energy role it's just you know seeing if he his offensive game can translate to basically being uh, able to ride shotgun with Backlund and Coleman instead yeah 
You know, and honestly, the guy I thought, I mean, before I looked at all the signings they brought in, the guy I expected to be in that position was Dryden Hunt. The coach seems to like him. He was there last year. I kind of, I expected Dryden Hunt to start on that fourth line spot, but it's a good problem to have. You got more NHL bodies than you got NHL spots for. Yep, and you can easily put Hunt in the AHL. Um, I think Hunt is old enough. Like, we need a 13th forward. I think Hunt will stick around as the 13th guy because he's not going to get any better playing in the American League. No. Uh, we don't need him down there, and I think he's the kind of guy that can quickly transition to an NHL spot if you have a Yeah, it, it just depends if they want to just uh, have him on the Wranglers for veteran leadership. I could also see Hunt getting claimed on waivers. Yeah. So we'll see. Um, I think that uh, there are you've got you've got Martin Furk, you got Jared Tenardi. You're going to have your veteran leaders already. Yeah. I, I think that the Flames, though, like barring like Peltier having an absolute disastrous camp, where like it's like, do you even know what end of the stick is up level mm-hmm. of bad? Um, that then he should start in the NHL and. Sir, are you supposed to be at the Roughnecks camp? You don't look like a hockey player. Yeah, it, you know, it's... Unless that happens, uh, you know, like, I expect him to remain. Uh, and if he plays that badly, then you don't really mind losing him on waivers, because... That's true, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think... I think we may have to recalibrate our expectations for this player. We'll see how he recovers and plays after his shoulder surgeries, but he may not end up being the high-end player a lot of people expect. No, and he might not even remain as an NHLer, frankly. Like, it, it, it sucks, but stuff like that, you know, like how many years did Monaghan look terrible before finally start, you know, after having several surgeries and, you know, rehabbing for a couple of years you know for him to mm-hmm. look more like himself so we'll see it, it's gonna be an interesting situation on the back end right now i'd say the top six are Weger, anderson bean marimanov ball and pakal i think we can both agree that Weger, anderson bean and ball are the for sure nhlers yeah. the flames like marimanov and i think coming into the season he had a uh, guaranteed spot. I don't know if that's the case anymore. We'll see. Um, I think he'd have to play his way out of the lineup, but I think there's a possibility that he could. Yeah, and uh, I think the, um, if either Miramanov or uh, Pahal play poorly, uh, I think Barry gets signed and um, they move the other player to the AHL for See, I still think Barry gets signed either way because that's the kind of guy I want to carry is seven. He's 33. He can sit on the bench. He's not going to develop anymore. I think I think it's either Barry or Tenorti is your seven, and I'd take Barry. Yeah. Well, and Hanley's there too, so... Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I Yeah, I think that like the Flames will probably shift a couple of these guys to the A um, regardless. Yeah. And- Hanley, if, I mean, if we lost Hanley, how long? What's Hanley's deal? But if we if we lost Hanley to waivers, I wouldn't be sad. No, they, um, like we got him off waivers off of Dallas after the Tanev trade. If we lost yeah. him on waivers, it's like, okay, sure. And and I think that if we're looking at a seven who needs to be able to step in in short notice, I. I know we're never going to have him again, but the Michael Stone is the ideal for that, right? Stone could not play for six months and he came in and looked like he just played yesterday. And I think you're more likely to get that out of a Barry than out of a Hanley. I agree. So, yeah, I think that everyone's locked in there. I feel, I was looking at Jersey numbers here. I feel a little bad for Kevin Ball. He pl- he wore 88 in New Jersey, came here, was told he had to change his number because it was worn. And I, I then they moved number 88 and I guess he didn't get to go back. Yeah. Because he had uh, Manjapani had that number, and then like two days later they ship Manjapani out, and it's like, stop sewing, stop sewing. Yep. <laughs> but he'll be wearing seven this year. So Ball, I think, is an, uh, is an interesting entity too, and people haven't talked enough about him. I mean, that was the big piece coming back in the uh, in the Markstrom deal, and I'm kind of expecting the top four to be Uyghur, Anderson, Ball, Bean. Hmm. I think Bean and Miramanov could switch in and out, but I think they're bringing Ball in to develop him as a top four defenseman. Yeah, and he has shown enough where that is his trajectory. It's just that he's also very young. So, uh, but you know, if he can develop into that steady 
uh, number four, like that would be huge for the Flames, you know, and we'll see. Uh, you know, this whole season is kind of that we'll see because there are so many question marks on everybody, basically. And then moving to goaltending, I'd say the Flames have three NHL caliber goalies for a rebuild. Dustin Wolf, Dan Vladar, and Devin Cooley, who we talked about earlier. Um, no doubt, I think, that Dustin Wolf comes in, and I'll use air quotes, as the starter. Yes. I think he he's the only guy who has an NHL job locked in on the goalies. Fair to say? Yeah, and I think like, he'll get 45 to 50 starts this year, maybe more depending on how well he plays or not but i i figure that he'll be getting the bulk of the action uh but not necessarily playing every game um and if he doesn't i mean you know i've i don't even know if i'd give him 50 i was kind of thinking 35 to 40 because you want to ease this guy in and if he's having a bad night you want to make sure that you know you're giving him the rest we also don't and i've said this before Dan Vladar's played 75 NHL games. We still don't know we've got there either. Like, I think the Flames need to evaluate both these guys. And if Vladar is healthy, I see this being a 1A, 1B scenario. Yeah. Um, you I, know, I who's... wouldn't be surprised if they play equal amounts of games. And I think it all, it's also a good time to test Wolf. How well can he do in relief? That sort of thing. Yeah, and it's one of those where I think that, you know, you're going to see each guy, like, more or less, like, the play till you lose yeah more or less and you know like if you have a really bad game oh well you know come back next time and we'll see yeah and and you know i think we can't write dan vladar off there right he's he's looked good i mean vladar's had times he's looked fantastic vladar's had times he's looked like a backup with 75 starts that's still an unproven goaltender and i think it's an exciting place to be in the big question is is vladar healthy and if he is, great. Then I think it's Vladar Wolf, no question. If he's not, Cooley probably gets some games. Or, let's just be honest, it's going to be easy to go out there and find a back. Yeah. No, and realistically, Cooley, I think, is your Jamie McLennan type guy where, you know, he just he drifts around in the background and pops in when needed. And, you know, uh, I don't think uh, the Flames are in any urgency to like uh, bring up Ignatiev or anybody like that. No, and I don't think Ignatiev is ready, and I think that they might want to even go out and get one more goalie in the system just in case Cooley comes up so Ignatiev has somebody. Mm -hmm. Because last year they were borrowing ECHL goalies when Dustin Wolf was coming up, um, and I don't know if that's necessarily the best way to go. But well, well, didn't they didn't they have a goalie who was playing in the ECHL? What happened to him? Uh, well, I think. Uh... I think uh, Connor Murphy is the uh Yeah, but they they had some guy they drafted. I don't oh, know. Oh, uh, show. Yeah, what happened to him? I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> so good we don't even know where you are. Um but yeah, I mean, you know, and, and there's always a everybody's got a, you know, veteran guy. Everyone's got that, you know, 29, 30-year-old guy who's just been around for a while and is looking for, you know, to catch on. I could even see the Flames pick up a guy like that. I mean, not on waivers because you got to leave him in the NHL, but I can see the Flames bring in a guy that has a free agent or, you know, as part of a trade or something like that if they need another goaltender. Because I, I really think in today's day and age, if you want your AHL team to be competitive, you need four or five goaltenders. Yeah. And uh, Chechelev, by the way, he's in the KHL now. So. Okay, so didn't work out over here or didn't want to play in Rapid City. Yeah. I don't even know where Rapid City is. I probably wouldn't want to play there either. Sounds like something out of a superhero movie, doesn't yes. it? Rapid City? Yes. Um, for those that don't know, the Rapid City Rush, the Calgary Flames' current, they're in South Dakota, um, the Calgary Flames' current ECHL affiliate. So not uncommon to see a goaltender put in the ECHL to get minutes. Better start there than back up in the AHL. And again, I could see um, Ignatiev start there as well for the same reason. But I, you're right. They used Murphy. They used a few different guys last year. I think that... They might be on the hunt for somebody else. We'll see. But a large part of this depends on is Vladar ready or not. If he is, you've got your two. Um, is Wolf still waiver eligible this year? I think so, yes. But I okay. do not foresee any reason why he'd get sent down. No, or sorry, waiver exempt. I mean, the only reason I'm asking, Matt, is let's say they wanted to bring Cooley up. I could see them maybe and make a paper transaction 
where you, you know, he wasn't going to play anyways. It was going to be Villar's game or something. So you send him down just to free a roster spot or something like that. I could see that, but yeah, I, I don't think that they're going to bother with that um, just for respect. Don't even move your stuff out of the dressing room. Just sit upstairs tonight. Yeah. Go walk yeah, I don't know. walk across to the other dressing room to report and then go upstairs. <laughs> well, I assume all the coaches share the same office. You report to the same place, but yeah. Um, I mean, or, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. I was going to say, send him down during the All-Star break or something, not have him play, but yeah, there's no reason to do that. If you think he's an NHLer, you keep him up there. So, Wolf definitely, and we'll see what happens around Wolf, but I think fans have to be careful with expectations of Wolf. He's looked great at the AHL level. I don't think he's going to come out and be the next Mika Kippersoff. I don't think this guy's going to come and take the organization on his back. Um, no, and I to think that- give like the more direct comparison, like UC Soros, for the first two seasons he was in Nashville, was terrible. Like He, he was yeah. he would show flashes of potential, but he didn't look great at any for long durations. And then he yeah. developed into one of the best goalies in the NHL. For sure, and even Wolf had some struggles last year at the NHL yeah. level. Yeah, and so like expecting him like day one to basically be of that caliber is not realistic. But uh, you know, in a couple of years, you know, he should be if his development goes the right way. Yeah, so I think you know fans have to be patient there and remember that this guy is, uh, you know. This guy is a, a young NHL goaltender, and we need to give him time to develop. And sometimes the best way to help goalies develop is to take him out of the net at some point, too. Like, if he's getting shelled, take him out. Let him sit the next one, right? we got to see what we've got in Vladar as well. So I think it's going to be that's going to be an interesting story for this season. Mm-hmm. Matt, is there anybody without – I mean, obviously, this is the – we're recording on the eve of uh, preseason starting, so we haven't seen these guys play – we're not expecting um, Parekh to be in the NHL. We're not expecting Hanzig to be in the NHL. Like, I think the names that we've talked about, maybe a couple outside candidates like a Klapka or... Morton, um, maybe. Some, yeah, I don't even know about Morton. He hasn't even played a year in the American League yeah. yet. Um, but, you know, maybe, like we talked about Dryden Hunt, Klapka. Um, we're not expecting um, Brzevich to be in the NHL. Like, fans have to remember that we're rebuilding but we've got to build both programs and these young guys uh, I used to say this all the time when the team was in Stockton you want to see them buy a ticket to the AHL right and I think you want to see Hanzig you want to see Bershtavich you want to see um, I don't know does anybody want to see Ignatiev um, you know buy your ticket to the Wranglers go see them there but we need to have patience with bringing these guys up and it's hard when they were over in California now that they're here it's easy to see them and I think both for fans and management there's probably not that rush to just get them on the ice so we can see them yeah and realistically like most of the guys that are the exciting players are still two three four years away from being in the NHL and you know like as much as like Parak his offensive game is awesome he is terrible defensively and you know he needs to it's funny to me because he plays defense i know but like he needs to get some more experience and place some emphasis on playing defense because there was a number of odd man rushes in the uh, the penticton tournament that were caused by him not playing very good defensively um and that's against prospects you get him against nhlers like that he's gonna get lit up like a christmas tree so yeah you know like that's not fair to him either no and the only i guess other outside name potentially would be jeremy poirier but he didn't play most last year because of an injury so i think that you're you're gonna tell the guy go back to the american league this year and kind of repeat it's almost like kids who you know fill the third grade after repeat third grade you didn't play last year so repeat your dev year yeah and realistically like we saw with connor zari where like he lost a lot of time then played a bit and you know back up in the nhl like and yeah. i could see poirier not spending a ton of time down there either if he rebounds to where he should be yeah i mean poirier and solovia are i think the only viable real you know young defensive call up that you have yeah and like you could like later on in the season might you know like after the trade deadline you might see grushnikov and kuznetsov get some time in the nhl just to like hey this is what it's like yeah but i mean yeah that case moran hurt 
Hurtig if they go pro, um, you know, Yarny Yermo. Like, there's some different options there, but I think that if you're looking for a viable, you know, guy to fill in, you're down to Soloviev and Poirier. Mm-hmm. I think Kuznetsov gets pushed way down the depth chart because of some of these other signings. Yeah, well, and Kuznetsov, it'll be interesting to see how he plays this year. Um, like, him and Grushnikov are very similar in a lot of ways, so it'll be interesting to see how they push against each other as they're because they're both kind of vying for the similar jobs so yeah we're talking about um ahl goalies so the other goalies that are at camp right now are connor murphy and matt radomsky both of whom have had some ahl time with the wranglers so i bet i wouldn't be surprised if either um they sign one of them i think murphy might actually be signed already and sent to the echl or they're kept on as a third goalie but I think one of those two goes you to could Rapid definitely City, see, yeah. Yeah, you could definitely see them sent to Rapid City. Um, or even kept in the AHL as a third goalie. I mean, it's... I don't even know how you get to Rapid City from here. Like That's got to be a bit of a journey. You might want to keep a guy closer. Yeah. We'll see. Um, but, yeah, I think this year we kind of know where the roster is going to be, at least on opening day. But I think there's a, a number of spots that could get taken and just like last year the calgary flames will be making trades during the year i mean there's guys like kuzmenko who likely will not resign here guys like mantha uh, mantha who we know were on their way out so if you are matt coronado or adam klapka or dryden hunt you know at some point there's going to be a spot your job is to show the wranglers coaches that you're the guy that should you know get yeah, that call exactly and I think that gives these young guys something good to play for. Because if you're just... Go, it's got to be demoralized and saying, I'm on a rebuilding team and I'm stuck in the American League. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's one of those where, you know, if you play well enough, you'll take those spots. It's just you have to actually do the whole, uh, you know, play well yeah, enough. we to, know the spot will be open. It's, yeah. it's up to, you know, those guys who will take it. Mm-hmm. So... Um, I think that that gets that gets us to I guess where we are now with the Flames and the Ice. Before we talk or preview the preseason, just want to make another note here. We learned in the uh, off season that Rick Ball, the TV voice of the Calgary Flames, has has moved on. He's moving on to Chicago, and it's it's thirty uh, nine year old John Abbott who will be replacing him as the TV voice voice of the Flames. Abbott turns forty in January, and he already has two plus decades of experience behind the mic, including NHL stints in Toronto. Vancouver and Ottawa, where he's most recently been part of the Senators telecast for TSN. He's called six straight installments of the World Junior Championships and was in the radio booth for the men's hockey tournament in 2018 uh, in the China Olympics. So, a very experienced hockey guy. Sort of reminds me of Derek Wills coming in, a guy that has a lot of experience, but a younger face, a younger guy there that I think can grow with the team for a long time. I'm excited to hear John Abbott's voice on our broadcast. Yeah, and congrats to Rick Ball. He gets to go call Connor Bedard's career, which that would be exciting for him. So, you know, uh, wish him all the best in Chicago. And- yeah, you know, and, and I mean, if you listen to Rick Ball talk about it, he's excited. It's an original six team. It's a great market. You know, as much as we hate to see guys go, what a fantastic career opportunity for Rick Ball. Yeah. So good for him. Thanks for everything you've done here, Rick. And uh, John, welcome to the Sea of Red. We're excited to hear you call some games. Matt, the Flames have six or eight preseason games between now and the start of the season. We won't do our recaps yet because it's hard to even know who we're facing or what we're doing. Uh, tonight, on Sunday the 22nd, the Flames kick off the preseason on the road. They are in Seattle, not too far of a road trip. On the 23rd is the usual split squad games with Edmonton. Half the team here. You and I will be at that one at the Dome. Half team in Edmonton. Then they play a neutral site game on the 25th. And when I saw that, I looked it up and said, where's the neutral site? It's Abbotsford. That's not really neutral site, but okay. They're playing in the American... I thought that's like when they played in China or stuff like that years ago. But they're playing in the AHL home of the uh, of the Vancouver team. Um, then they have two home games. The 28th, they're here. The 30th, they're here. Those are against Vancouver and uh, Seattle. And then they're on the road to Winnipeg. Winnipeg comes here on the 4th. And that is the end of the preseason schedule. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because they play on the 4th a preseason game that same day that the preseason opens overseas. I don't think we've ever had that before. Yeah, well, it does make sense because of the travel involved. 
but uh, yeah, I mean, why not? You know, it makes sense, right? Get teams playing at home, even if you're opening the season. But it's kind of weird the season's open, but not really because we're still finishing the preseason. Like usually, you just kind of say, okay, teams are playing over there, and then everyone will open three days later. Yeah. So eight preseason games. That seems like a lot. Didn't we play six last no, year? It's usually eight. Is it? Yeah, eight? it's okay. usually four home, four on the road. Okay, so we've got the same thing here. Um, you know, great. It's nice to have Seattle here now because it's another team that's close by that they can play, right? I mean, Winnipeg, not too far. Vancouver, not too far. Um, Seattle, not too far. Kind of weird to me that we only play Vancouver or Edmonton, the split squads. Yeah. Well, usually we play them twice, so it does it make do, sense. Yeah. It just And the split squads are sons with them. I think they've been with Winnipeg in the past. We've had various split squad opponents. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you know, these are all games the Flames could be back in their own bed for um, on the road. Like, you know, Winnipeg's probably the fur- Winnipeg is the furthest trip that they take, and that's not a, a far trip at all. So it's going to be really interesting to see these. Most of these are not on TV. If you want to watch them, you got to go to calgaryflames.com and stream them from there, but they will all be streamed. I think the Vancouver one's on Sportsnet on the weekend, and, the, um, and then the two Winnipeg games are on Sportsnet. But the first couple on the website um if you don't have them now's a great time to invest in dual monitors you can watch both split squad games at the same time and um yeah it's it's fun that hockey's back it's going to be interesting to see what the flames do during this preseason and more what more than what they do who they play and i think that's going to be the interesting thing to see Mm -hmm. you know who are they looking at like Peltier is getting NHL time. Who are they looking at? You know, Coronado and who are those cuts? And, and who, who are it, the surprises? Like last year, Connor Zari and Martin Pospisil kind of came out of nowhere in the, that preseason to push for the NHL jobs. They didn't get it right away, but they were the first call ups and, you know, and yeah. stuck. Well, and, and if there is a guy like that this year, I mean, we don't have spaces we just talked about. So if someone looks that good, who's not looking good that they're going to have to move out? Mm. There's a, I think, you know, as much as the rebuild is going to have its challenges for the Sea of Red and for fans here in Calgary, I think it's going to be an interesting preseason because of it. Yep. And there's a lot of interesting young talent. There's a lot of, you know, veterans that I think are going to be interesting. Um, we'll, we'll see how this shakes down. But, Matt, we will talk to you next week after the, I guess, the first part of the preseason is over, the first four games, if we count the split squad as two. And we will talk about what we've seen so far. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Lots of fun. So, And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.